You might not want to hear this, given the amount of time we spent learning to find matrix inverses, but you should basically never find the inverse of a matrix in real world situations. And there are several reasons for this. First of all, finding inverses is slow. It might not seem like it ought to be because finding inverses is just done via Gauss-Jordan elimination. And it doesn't seem like Gauss-Jordan elimination is particularly slow. But let's look again at this example we did where we found the inverse of a matrix. So first of all, we took this matrix and put it into row echelon form. And that took a fair number of steps, as you can see. And we had to do all of those steps over here as well. But once the matrix is in row echelon form, putting it in reduced row echelon form is quite quick. And the reason it's quick is because we have all of these zeros. Like to go from here to here, we had to multiply the third row by negative two and add it to the second row. But because this was a zero and this was zero, multiplying these by negative two and adding them to the second row didn't do anything. In practice, we just had to multiply a single number by negative two and add it to the second row. Over here, though, we don't have those zeros. When we multiply this row by negative two and added it to the second row, we had to pay attention to every number in the third row. And we had to multiply all of them by negative two. And we had to add all of those to the second row. So because of this, the back word phase of the Gauss-Jordan elimination, which is usually much quicker than the forward phase, is going to be extremely slow because you don't have all of those zeros over here hurrying things along. Now, for a three by three matrix, it's probably not going to matter that much. But if you get to matrices that are, say, 20 by 20, your calculator is going to start noticeably chugging if you tell it to compute a matrix inverse. So even when we're working with computational software, computing the inverses of large matrices is going to be a very slow process and should be avoided for that reason. But it gets worse than that. 
Finding inverses is a numerically unstable process. What does that mean? Well, suppose you have a matrix of real world observations. This matrix is going to include some errors in it. And the reason it's going to include errors is that most real world data is infinite decimals, whereas our observations are going to not be infinite decimals. We can't enter infinite decimals into our calculator. Our data is going to be rounded. So it's going to be an approximation of the real world observations, but it's not going to be exactly the real world observations. Well, this is fine, right? Suppose our data is accurate to five decimal faces. And this data goes in to a matrix. And I find the inverse of the matrix. Well, it isn't fine. Whereas our original data might have been accurate to five decimal places, the process of taking this inverse makes the errors worse. And sometimes it makes the errors substantially worse. To the point where if we have a large matrix, and I not even a large matrix. We can see this in like seven by seven matrices, where we have a little rounding error here, and we find an inverse, and the rounding error here causes the inverse to not even be close to the right answer. So this is a pretty unappealing combination. Finding the inverse is slow. And once we do find the inverse, there's no guarantee that we've actually found the inverse due to rounding error. And for these two reasons, I feel very comfortable in saying that you should not be finding inverses in real world situations. And I think that sort of 
Brooks a natural question. If we can't find inverses, then what is any of this for? We'll answer that question in the next section, but I'll give a summary answer for now. It is of great theoretical importance to know whether a matrix has an inverse. So in the real world, we're not so interested in finding inverses, but we're very interested in whether an inverse exists. 